On September 1st, Magdalene Shea reported her husband missing, and the police arrived at Spawn Ranch to investigate. They spoke with Ruby Pearl, who later said, I knew Shorty for approximately 10 years. I saw him almost every day. When Shorty returned to the ranch, after splitting from his wife, he brought a box of very pretty dishes given to him as a wedding gift. Two weeks after his disappearance, I went to the ranch and the Manson family was using the dishes. I asked what they were doing with Shorty's dishes and Lynn Frome said, he won't, and stopped speaking abruptly. Also on September 1st, 11-year-old Stephen Weiss found the .22 Longhorn behind his home. A Boy Scout, the sixth grader knew not to touch the gun by its handle. He held it by the end of the barrel instead. The gun was missing the right butt grip following Texas beating of Wojtek Frykowski. Weiss's father called Van Nuys police and investigators assigned to the Cielo Drive murders arrived at the Weiss home. Those investigators weren't as diligent as the scout. They manhandled the weapon, putting their own fingerprints all over it while the boy watched. The police, who admitted to Vice's father that they didn't even know how to open the revolver, obscured the fingerprints left by Watson three weeks earlier. Stephen and his father told the officers that they believed the gun might be linked to the Tate killings in nearby Benedict Canyon. Police had sent out circulars to the region's law enforcement offices with pictures of a similar gun and even mentioned the missing handle grip. But the investigators at the vice residence that day didn't remember those circulars. They had no idea that a good Samaritan had just turned in the very weapon they were supposed to be looking for. Seven shell casings plus two live bullets were still in the revolver when it was booked into evidence in Van Nuys. Long after the culprits were in jail and under investigation, still nobody linked the gun found by Stephen Weiss to the crimes in Benedict Canyon. When Susan Atkins went before the grand jury in December, three months later, Mr. Weiss called police to remind them of the weapon in their possession. At LAPD, the Tate investigation had turned inward toward the victims. They were looking at the subject of Roman's films, film reels they found in the home of Sharon and Roman making love, the question of ritualistic satanic worship, botched drug deals. The police withheld many details about the crimes initially, which caused some in the press to create more salacious and outlandish claims. LA Bureau Chief for the New York Times, Stephen Roberts, was quoted as saying, live freaky, die freaky as though the victims were responsible for what happened to them. Sharon's father, Colonel Paul Tate, began a secret investigation after his retirement from the military that fall. He went deep into the underground, altering his previously square appearance to talk to hippies and counterculture figures looking for clues about the killers. But his wife Doris sank into a deep depression, and her two teenage daughters, Deborah, 16, and Patricia, just 11, seemingly lost both parents that season along with their older sister. Deborah remembered the damage that the news reports and investigation did to her family. They couldn't fool me with their lies, but their lies cost my mother her sanity. She had a nervous breakdown. The lights went off, and she didn't come home for 10 years. Psychic Peter Herkos gained access to Cielo Drive, convincing police to allow him in the property alone overnight. Herkos walked through the house, touching various items, trying to picture what happened. Eventually, he claimed that he had a vision of someone on a bad LSD trip, freaking out and attacking the other guests. Other psychics tried to profit off their grim prognostications. Rudy Altabelli, after police finally turned the home back over to him, filed civil claims against the estates of the victims for damages. While many people found this crass, there was more than $100,000 in damage to the property. He had to have the house not just cleaned, but repaired to rent again. He leased it to 19-year-old actress Olivia Hussey, 
of Romeo and Juliet, ultimately was her manager. Hussey moved in five weeks after the murders. People would say, how could you live there, she recalled. I'd say, in England, most of the houses have horrible memories. It's not that big of a deal. While Charlie and most of the family journeyed to Death Valley in early September, a few remained at Spawn Ranch, including Cappy, Colleen Sinclair, and Country Sue. Colleen, or Collie as she was known, was a 16-year-old originally from San Francisco. She met the family through Sue Bartell. One day at the ranch that fall, Country Sue and Collie decided to doodle on a cupboard door. According to Sue, I didn't go, but everyone else did, which meant that there was nobody left to take care of George, take care of the horses, take care of the ranch that Charlie loved, and he left three of us girls behind. That would have been Cappy and me and another friend of mine from the valley, Collie Sinclair. Her and I were the authors of the infamous cupboard door that said Helter Skelter on it. We were writing down the words to a song we liked, period, nothing scary. Before the family departed for the desert, they stole a red Toyota 4x4 from a Los Angeles resident. They'd also been stealing other dune buggies in advance of their retreat as well. This again begs the question, the LASO spent up to four months building a case against the family for auto theft. During their investigation, they also learned about the stolen credit cards, drugs, underage runaways, and other infractions of Manson's federal parole. They finally arrested everyone on August 16th, only to release them two days later when the judge realized that the warrant was misstated. Clearly, the police continued to keep an eye on Spawn Ranch in the week following the arrests because Manson was arrested again on August 22nd on what seemed to be trumped up charges for a cigarette that later proved to be non-narcotic. But wasn't the sheriff still investigating the family even though they had to be released? Just because there was a clerical error with a warrant didn't mean the investigation wasn't continuing, right? Doesn't it posit that Gleason and the other officials would still have been closely watching the family, waiting for another chance to pounce? If so, why were they not aware they were stealing more vehicles and other supplies, not to mention killing another innocent person? As Charlie and the others headed to Death Valley, he was unaware that one member of the entourage had a secret agenda. They offered me a case of beer to go up to Barker Ranch, Juan Flynn explained, but the reason I went was to find out what happened to Shorty. The family first drove to Myers Ranch, but found Goler Wash in poor shape. Some of the vehicles couldn't make it over the pass. Those dune buggies came in handy to ferry people and supplies from the road to the ranch house. Brenda, Bruce, and Tex drove ahead of the others and arrived first at Paul Crockett's. Paul Watkins and Brooks Poston were living with Crockett. Joan, Juanita, Wildebush, and Bob Berry, Crockett's partner, eloped that summer and were away on honeymoon when the rest of the family arrived in Death Valley. Watkins was shocked at the appearance of his friends, notably Tex. I could hardly believe it was the same person. He looked like a zombie. His face was unshaven. His hair had grown several inches and hung over his eyes. His vapid stare unnerved me. Paul offered to drive the three to Myers Ranch to join the others. There he saw Manson for the first time in two months. It wasn't long before Paul heard what happened to Shorty. Clem told him that he, Bruce, and Tex stabbed the ranch hand. Bruce confirmed this, and that night Paul spoke to Charlie. As he later testified, Manson said we had to kill Shorty, and he said that he's been bad-mouthing the ranch and that he knew too much about the fountain of the world and so that he was messing things up up there. He's been calling the man on the ranch. Manson bragged that Clem cut Shay's head off with a machete. Brooks also got an earful that week. He overheard Manson say, in the presence of Davis, Watson, and others, that the family had to kill the stuntman because he was calling the police on them 
and conspiring with Frank Retz to get them kicked off the ranch. Charlie told Poston that Shay was really hard to kill, that he had fought hard for his life. Barbara Hoyt also heard Manson say that the family killed Shorty. They said they had something that they wanted to show him, and then he got into the dune buggy and they took him away, and then they hit him in the head with a pipe. Uh, they pulled him out of the car and they started stabbing him, and then um, they kept stabbing him and stabbing him. And Charlie said, or Shorty said, why, Charlie, why? And Charlie said, why? This is why. And then he stabbed him again. And uh, he said that it was it was very hard to kill him until they brought him to now. And when they brought him to now, he said that Clem cut his head off. A reminder, however, that Shay's head was not cut off. And nobody else has claimed that Charlie actually stabbed Shay. He was there, and we do have Bruce Davis's parole statement that Manson might have stabbed the ranch hand, but even he was unsure, and nobody else who participated has corroborated this. Within a day or so of their arrival, Charlie and Tex drove into town. They spoke with Ballarat Bob, custodian for Barker Ranch, who said they were fine to stay there if it was up to him. Then Manson visited with Arlene Barker, she flew up in her private jet to visit a local Indian reservation and gave consent for the family to stay at her property again. Charlie split the family between the two properties, Myers and Barker Ranch, and sent Clem and Squeaky back to Spawn Ranch. For a full month after the Tate-LaBianca murders, none of their killers were talking openly about the crimes, with the exception of Texas' confession to Diane. Yet Shorty's murder became open knowledge within the first week in Death Valley. Maybe that was intentional. Charlie wanted to remind everyone of the penalty for snitching or ditching, in case anyone was thinking of leaving. And it wasn't much longer before the Cielo and Waverly Drive murders also became known. Sadie, for instance, just couldn't keep her mouth shut. And within days of their arrival in the desert, dropped her first hints about those unsolved murders in L.A. Barbara recalled, In early September, I was taking a nap in the bedroom at Myers Ranch. I woke up and heard Sadie talking to Ruth Ann Morehouse. I didn't pay attention until I heard the name Tate. Then I started listening. She said that Sharon Tate was the last to die, that she had to watch the others die first. She said that Sharon had called for her mother, she said that Abigail had called for God, and she said Tex ran over and gutted her. I walked back to Barker Ranch and saw Tex. He said, Barbara, your face is all the colors of the desert. I thought that if he or anyone else figured out what I knew, I wasn't going to be alive anymore. I started working on trying to get out of the desert. On September 4th, Linda Kasabian arrived in Los Angeles to claim Tanya from the foster care system. She met with a social services officer and explained that she left her daughter in the care of Mary Bruner and that she was staying at the Church of Macrobiotics in Taos. Linda said she planned to take Tanya back to New Mexico with her, and the man was suitably impressed that she was fit to resume parental responsibility for her child. Tanya was returned to her mother that evening. The two immediately went to New Mexico although they did not remain there long. Linda went to Florida shortly thereafter, then to Milford, New Hampshire, where her mother lived. She remained there until her arrest three months later. In Susan's book, The Myth of Helter Skelter, she claimed, when Linda Kasabian found out about the arrests, she figured it would be safe to sneak back to Los Angeles and get her daughter from the courts without anyone from the family finding out. She was horrified to find from the caseworker that a young woman had already showed up to claim the child, but was refused when she couldn't provide any identification. The same day Linda was reunited with Tanya, Bobby had a pre-trial hearing in a Malibu courtroom. He was remanded to stand trial for the murder of Gary Hinman on November 12th. Also that day, Stephanie Schramm called Spawn Ranch hoping to escape her parents' house in Anaheim. Clem and Squeaky 
drove down to pick her up, returned to Spawn Ranch, and then a few hours later left for Death Valley. They were driving a green Ford sedan, which Brenda rented days earlier with a stolen credit card. Stephanie's arrival upset Manson. Days later, Charlie hit the pregnant 17-year-old in the head with a rifle. Kitty Ludesinger, also pregnant, and 16-year-old Diane Lake were the brunt of Manson's rage that fall. He was absolutely brutal, controlling, and hysterical those final weeks in the desert. On September 9th, Sadie tracked down the home that had been fostering Zizo since her arrest, broke in, and took him. She then brought him to the desert. On September 10th, Charlie visited Crockett's. The past winter, family members were arrested in Death Valley for giving a deputy's daughter some marijuana. Manson continued to hold a grudge against that guy, so he asked Brooks if he would kill the sheriff's deputy. Poston refused. Around September 15th, Charlie tried to force Simi Valley Sherry to perform oral sex on Juan Flynn. Sherry refused, and Charlie beat her soundly for her insubordination. He then forced Barbara to do what Sherry refused, and in fear for her safety, Hoyt complied. That night, Sherry and Barbara started talking. Barbara whispered that she overheard Zay talking about stabbing someone. In panic, the teens decided to run away. They didn't sneak out covertly into the night. At dawn on the 16th, they simply announced their intention to leave and walked away. As they departed, some of the other women, surprisingly Gypsy and Oish, also expressed doubts about what was going on and wondered if they too should leave. When Charlie discovered Sherry and Barbara missing, he tore into whoever was on sentry and then drove into Ballarat. He found the girls eating breakfast in the local general store. He stood outside and tried to lure them back to him using some kind of witchy hand signals. The girls went outside and flatly told him they weren't coming back. Charlie simmered down, gave them some cash, and wished them well. The girls got a lift to Trona by the owner of the store, where they bought some shoes and purchased bus tickets back to L.A. Barbara found her way back to her folks. Initially, nobody was certain where Sherry had gone, and some actually believed that she was one of the many other rumored victims of the Manson gang, but she simply went underground. Later, she resurfaced and married Danny DiCarlo. Charlie's clemency, of course, was a facade. Once back at Barker Ranch, she ordered Clem and Bruce to drive to Los Angeles, find Barbara and Sherry, and kill them both. While Clem and Bruce were in L.A., searching for Sherry Cooper and Barbara Hoyt, Juan Flynn became the next to defect. He ran to Crockett's, joining Paul and Brooks at the prospector's cabin. On September 16th, Sandra Good gave birth to her son, Ivan. She called him Cho. The infant was delivered in a Los Angeles hospital after Sandy spent nearly three days in labor. When she delivered, some of her sister wives were there for his birth. She claimed Joel Pugh as the father of her infant son on his birth records, even though she knew that Bobby Beausoleil was actually the father. She also listed her own name as Sandra Pugh on the birth certificate. Likely, she was worried, with her recent arrest record, that the authorities might take her baby away from an unwed, felonious mother. Her former boyfriend, Joel, was in London, studying at Scientology headquarters. He was dead before a year end. Likely, it was suicide, but it looks suspicious to some Manson family scholars. After Cho's delivery, Sadie and Katie visited Sandy in the hospital. Sadie started dropping hints about the name Tate. Katie threw her an angry look, and Sandy demanded to know what was going on. They told her about Cielo Drive. They told her that Sharon was pregnant when she was stabbed to death. When Sandy asked them about the unborn baby in the actress's womb, Katie looked at Cho and said, You have him in your arms. In their lunacy, they believed they had claimed Sharon's unborn child 
and passed him energetically to their sister to raise. <laughs>